Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve O'Connick, the Lynn County Emergency Management Coordinator. Uh, appreciate your attendance today at uh, today's press conference. Uh, I'll start off this afternoon's briefing with our um, with our Lynn County Public Health Representative, Heather Matter. Good afternoon. COVID-19 is circulating in Iowa communities and many more Iowans are likely to become ill in the coming weeks. To reiterate what we have said several times, social distancing is putting space between yourself and other people. Maintain a distance of six feet between yourself and others. Avoid gatherings greater than 10 people. Cover your cough, clean your hands, and contain yourself at home when sick. The actions you take today and in the near future will directly impact the ability of our healthcare system to care for those that are ill. Every single person needs to do their part to stop the spread of COVID-19 to our business community. If not implemented already, businesses need to prepare their workforce to be impacted by COVID-19. Actively encourage sick employees to stay home. Educate employees about how they can reduce the spread of COVID-19 by covering coughs, sneezes, washing their hands, and staying home when ill, no matter how mild the illness. Be prepared for a large segment of your workforce to be impacted. Governor Reynolds has ordered many facilities to be closed to stop the spread of this virus. The following are hereby closed. All restaurants, bars, fitness centers, health clubs, health spas, gyms, aquatic centers, swimming pools, medical spas, massage therapy establishments, hair salons, barber shops, tattoo establishments, tanning facilities, theaters, live performance venues, motion picture shows, casinos, gaming facilities, senior citizen centers, adult daycare facilities. This proclamation goes through March 31st, 2020, but this is subject to change and the date may be extended under the governor's authority. On March 22nd, the Iowa Department of Public Health updated isolation guidance for Iowans. This updated guidance applies to well Iowans, Iowans that are not sick, but may have the potential for exposure to COVID-19. This guidance states that Iowans should stay at home and isolate themselves from other people for 14 days if they have traveled outside of Iowa for business or vacation in the last 14 days, or if they live with someone who has symptoms of COVID-19, or they live with someone that has tested positive for COVID-19. To reiterate, even if there is not a diagnosis of COVID-19, but the person is symptomatic, so symptoms of fever, cough or shortness of breath, we are asking you to stay home for 14 days. Most Iowans infected with COVID-19 will experience only a mild to moderate illness. Most mildly ill Iowans do not need to go to their healthcare provider or to be tested to confirm that they have COVID-19. Sick Iowans must stay home and isolate themselves from others in their house. If you think you may need health care, call your health care provider 
first. Your provider will assess whether you need to be seen in the office or if you can recover at home. This will help to ensure that the limited supplies of personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, is conserved for those most in need of medical assistance. Iowans that are ill with a fever or respiratory symptoms, such as a fever, cough, or shortness of breath, should stay home and isolate themselves from others in the house until they have met the following conditions. They have no fever for at least 72 hours. That is a full three days of no fever without the use of fever reducing medications. And other symptoms have improved for at least 72 hours. For example, cough, shortness of breath, have continually improved for over three days. And finally, at least seven days have passed since the beginning of the first symptom. Again, this is for all ill Iowans, regardless of the diagnosis of COVID-19. This is a stressful time for many, and it's important to monitor your mental health. If you are feeling well, it is okay to go outside in the fresh air as long as you follow social distancing guidelines. It's okay to go for a walk. It's okay to go for a run. It's okay to work in your garden. These are healthy activities and can improve your mental health. These can be done as long as social distancing guidelines are followed. We ask that you stay at least six feet away from others. We understand in a time of crisis, many people want to help. Right now, the best way to help is for you to stay home. This is hard for Iowans to accept because we are Iowa nice and we want to help each other. But the best way you can help is to stay home and to make a phone call or to send a note. Check in with older adults or those that are at risk for severe complications. Families and caregivers can help by knowing what medication their family members and loved one will need, monitor their food supplies, and help them to stock up on food. Another way Iowans can help, visit the United Way of East Central Iowa's website, which is at uweci.org and click on the Volunteer Now at the top of the page for a selection of volunteer opportunities in our area. Some opportunities may include sewing masks or preparing food boxes. We would also like to share a few messages from the Lynn Area Partners Active in Disaster. Quick read thermometers for mental health and child care providers are needed. Donations of these thermometers can be dropped off at the HACAP corporate office located at 1515 Hawkeye Drive in Hiawatha between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. Individuals dropping off will need to ring the doorbell as lobbies are closed for general walk-in traffic. Clamshell food containers are important for nonprofit agencies to distribute food to our most valuable, vulnerable populations. Please call Heritage Area Agency on Aging at 319-398-5559 to arrange donations of these containers. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Tony Myers, Chief of Medical Affairs, Mercy Medical Center. Doctor. Good afternoon. Um, I agree with everything that Heather clearly said. It was a wonderful outline of what we're facing right now. Um, this is this is this is the time, uh, and things have changed from preparation to now 
we really, really need to act in a very specific way. And I'm going to just throw out a little bit of math here. So we have four click cases. If you look at best case scenario of countries that have done really good, tight social distancing, staying at home, you're looking at a, a rate of doubling every four days. So that doesn't sound too bad, but you say eight and then 16 and then 32 and rapidly within three weeks, within three weeks we are looking at over 200 cases a day. Um, and those are new cases and it will just double at that point. You're looking at 20% of those needing to be hospitalized. So that's 40 patients per day needing to be hospitalized. And those people don't go home the next day. These are sick people, so they'll stay in the hospital. 20% um, of those that are in the hospital will require critical care, intensive care. A smaller number will require ventilation. And as we run through the numbers, you can see that over the next three weeks, that will rapidly put the hospitals in a position of stress. The hospitals have ramped up their ability to take care of patients that are critically ill by more than 200%. But even with that, again, I go back to the start of those numbers is that's if we do a really good job. And this is where we need to start doing things like figuring out how to help our neighbors uh, where if they, need to, if they need supplies, that we need to start looking at social networking on how we can have one person go to the store uh, and get groceries for the entire neighborhood or friends and family. We need, really need to limit going to any kind of a store and you need to stay inside. I agree with Heather that we need to be outside. We're Iowans, we need to be outside and breathe the fresh air. But going to the store is not the way to do it right now. We need to really tighten this down. If we don't do a good job, of doing that, the, the numbers immediately double uh, and they could worsen after that. If they double, by three weeks the hospitals will be in a very critical position on whether they will be able to take care of the number of critically ill we have. So I just want to stress again how important it is. This is when we all need to come together. We all need to stay at home. We need to sort of help our neighbors and we'll get through this but the next three weeks will determine how well we get through this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Myers. I'd like to introduce Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Unity Point Health. Doctor. Good afternoon. I'd like to reiterate some of the points made by my colleagues, both uh, Heather and Dr. Myers. If you have a mild illness, please call your physician or your primary care provider and ask for directions. Do not just present to whether it's an urgent care emergency room or the clinic. Uh, your physician or health care provider can guide you through that and direct you where you need to go next. Additionally, testing is restricted to the criteria by the Iowa Department of Public Health. And at this time, that is essentially summarized as individuals that have a febrile respiratory illness that we can't explain. We've ruled out the flu, we've ruled out heart failure, and we're limiting testing to that. So as Heather stated, and as Dr. Myers, asymptomatic people will not get tested. So do not uh, present thinking that that's what you're gonna do. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the community for their overwhelming response on sewing masks and uh, delivering them to St. Luke's Healthcare Foundation. Uh, it was so overwhelming we actually had to shut it down for a little bit, but that's back up and running, and it's, it was impressive the response that, that occurred. But I'm asking for one more favor, and that is for to stay home. Uh, as Dr. Myers indicated, if we can stay home during the next couple weeks, it will have a tremendous, uh, tremendous benefit. And I, I like to use the phrase, dig the well before you're thirsty. And so I'd li like not to be in the position where I'm digging the well while I'm thirsty. So thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Next, I'd like to introduce the city manager for the city of Cedar Rapids, Mr. Jeff Pomerantz. Thank you, Steve. As city manager, uh, it's my responsibility to announce today that the city of Cedar Rapids will be suspending its transit service. The fixed rate transit service effective Wednesday, March 25th as an additional measure to limit the spread of COVID-19. Like other recent city service and facility changes, 
and the other changes in services that we've heard about across our county, state, and country. The suspension of transit service is being done in response to recent recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the White House, the Iowa Department of Health, which caution against gatherings of people to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Suspending a service like transit is a very difficult decision for a city and for a community, but it's one we must make in order to help prevent a possible spike in the number of cases that could overwhelm our medical facilities. So again, we take this step uh, with great caution, with great concern, but also knowing, as we've heard from our medical community and from our Lynn County Department of Health and from our governor, that this is in the best interest of our community. We've been taking measures to regularly clean and completely sanitize all of our buses daily. But there's still a confined space that fill with many people throughout the day. We are at a critical moment, as we've heard, and preventing and limiting the spread of COVID-19 is job one for all of us, for the government, for the nonprofit community, for the business community, for our healthcare facilities, for all of us. It's vital that we take the actions needed to protect our community. Cedar Rapids Transit Service will continue today and tomorrow. Today, obviously, we just have a few hours left, but it will continue. And then Tuesday, March 24th, regular operations. After the close of business on Tuesday, the transit service will suspend until April 13th, 2020. That date could change to a later date upon further notice. Certainly, we all hope we won't have to do that. Neighborhood transportation service that we know of as NTS at Horizons will be expanding their after hour service to provide daytime rides to work for those with critical employment transportation needs, such as work at hospitals, work at grocery stores, work at care facilities and convenience stores and gas stations. It will not be business as usual. Uh, NTS is a small entity with dedicated management and employees, but there's only so much they will be able to do. So again, we're focusing all the rides to work uh, in those areas that I mentioned, those areas that we consider to be absolutely critical. To schedule a ride, citizens should call 319-363-1321 24 hours in advance. Uh, all that information is also available on the NTS uh, website, www.horizonsfamily.org. Uh, there you'll find the service schedule and regulations for NTS. We also operate as, as a close partnership with Lynn County. Lynn County Lifts Paratransit Service will continue rides for existing customers. And uh, today we have the Director of Lifts, uh, Mr. Tom Hardikoff, here to provide some more information uh, for these services. We recognize we, we usually try to limit the number of speakers but this is so important to get the word out to the users of public transit and to our paratransit users that we're going to have uh, several experts here to talk about these changes. Tom. Thank you, Jeff. So Lynn County Lifts will continue to provide essential services for existing customers. Essential services could be defined as medical trips, pharmacy trips, dialysis, grocery needs, 
This is for individuals with disabilities, individuals who have no other resources to access these services. All other persons in need of essential medical transportation can call Lyft. They can call at 319-892-5170. Again, that is 319-892-5170 to see if those rides would be available. Similar to NTS, we do not have an ex unexhausted supply of trips, but we will do what we can to assist the community. Priority will be given to seniors and persons with disabilities. The vehicle capacity of Lyft, and I speak for Mike with NTS, that is limited due to the social distancing requirements. So the old capacities are no longer in effect. We have to maintain that social distancing for the overall good. We have smaller buses, less space. Lyft has also expanded their cleaning regimen to include a thorough disinfecting of all vehicles every evening and wiping down all surfaces between riders to try to eliminate the spread of the COVID virus. Thank you. So uh, we'll be available uh, for questions uh, after the formal comments are complete, but I did want to ask Brad DeBroward to come up. Brad is the uh, director of uh, the Cedar Rabbit Transit System. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, just want to say that we regret any inconvenience or hardship that the, the suspension of bus service may cause to our passengers, especially those that are dependent on the buses. As has been said earlier many times in this meeting, that social distancing is critical at this time to keep our community safe. And that's difficult to do with the fixed route bus service. We are committed to reinstating the city bus service when we can better ensure a safe environment for our employees, passengers, and the public. Again, a sincere thanks to our partners, NTS and Lyfts, to help provide rides to those essential services and get us through this difficult situation. Thank you. Okay, that uh, concludes the prepared remarks. We'd uh, open it up to any of our media partners in the room for questions. I would just remind if there's a question from the room to uh, address it to the person who you want to ask the question to and the person answering to repeat the question for those that may not hear the question in the room. Dr. Myers from Mercy Medical Center. So the question was, what do I mean by the hospital being in a critical position? So there's two things there. Actually, there's multiple things that we look at. Um, one has to do with space, uh, especially uh, critical care space for patients. And then also we've got to realize that other there are other patients that have other things. So we're trying to separate uh, the patients that have the virus from other patients. So there's space issues. There's issues with um, the number of critical care beds. Again, we've ramped that up by 200%. There's uh, issues with ventilators. Again, we've increased that by 200% as well. Uh, and so when I state those numbers of the doubling every four days, which is what we're seeing with very good social isolation, it's very good because if we don't do it good, it's twice that high. Um, then we're getting into a position in three weeks where we're looking at 20 or 40 new hospitalizations per day. Um, and then you can just imagine those are, they're gonna be there for a while and then if we have 10 of them become critically ill, that's 10 per day of critically ill people. Uh, so uh, I guess the numbers sort of speak for themselves as far as how much we can take uh, until we get to a place where we're going to run out of resources to take care of them. No, we'll be okay if we do what we're supposed to do, right? And this is if we don't do what we are supposed to do at all. If we were, which we're, this community is already way ahead of a lot of communities. 
distance, right? We're already doing social distancing. We've already shut down the, you know, the restaurants and the bars and um, the transportation, which I knew I know was hard for the community to do. All of those things are the smart, right thing to do. So we're already in a way better position than than we would have been if not if we hadn't done that. Um, but now is the critical time. We can still overflow the hospitals if we don't do a really good job. And, I, and the reason why I bring it out, honestly, is that uh, over the weekend that I, I was, I had to go on an errand, and there were an awful lot of people out. Uh, and uh, I know that I know that people are working hard to stay in, but we've got to start being creative. And like I said, we've got to start thinking about not just our own needs, but sort of the community's needs, our local community, the neighborhood, our friends, and trying to, you know, make one visit uh, for multiple households and spreading things out as best we can. Now is the critical time to do it. How we act now in the next couple of weeks, three weeks, is going to define whether we get through this well, which I think we should, um, but it's critical, and that's the message, is we've got to do this right now. Well, that's what I was just saying when I went out to the drugstore this weekend. There were an awful lot of people out that, um, and so you know, actually, this is something that you can track on Google: um, how many people use a store in any given day at any given time, and actually, they have live data. And so, if you look at what we're doing now, I was, uh, you know, I, I spent this is what I do on my weekends: spend time doing things like looking at Google. Um, but you can track, and we are decreasing our use. So if you look at the drugstore that I was at, the use was less than the average use at one o'clock on a Sunday. It was less. It was just only about 20% less. We need to be better than that. We need to be you know, more than 50% less. Uh, and so that's, that's why I say is you know, there's, there's, there's clear, very good data that if we do this well now, then we'll get through this. And we'll be all right. Thanks. Any other questions from our media folks? Okay, we have a couple questions that we have uh, texted in from those. I'll uh, introduce Caitlin Emmerich from Lynn County Public Health. This question is from Kate Payne with Iowa Public Radio. She says, I'd like to know if Unity Point and Mercy are making the change some other hospitals are directing their staff to keep working if they come into contact with a positive COVID patient, so long as they themselves don't have symptoms. Knowing that people can transmit the virus before they have symptoms, wouldn't that increase the chance providers themselves become a vector of the disease? Thank you. I think the, the best way to answer that question is that uh, from a think of this as three compartments. You have the susceptible compartment, which is all of us because we don't have immunity. You have those that are infected or infectious and those that we've covered, which is a small number at this time. And we want to slow down the susceptible coming into that middle compartment. Both hospitals uh, issued very strict screening and restriction of visitors and screening of staff multiple times through their shift. Uh, also, we are masking uh, staff, uh, it, it, particularly if they're in direct patient care areas. It is true there's asymptomatic spread, and there is the potential that that may happen, but I think both hospitals have taken steps to minimize should that occur. Thank you. I also have two questions from Brian Morelli at the Gazette. The first one is for Stacy Walker. So Stacy Walker said he would be in favor of a local shelter at home order. Governor Reynolds today said local officials have that authority. Could Supervisor Walker and representatives from the cities share your perspective on this, when and how you would make a decision, and what other approach you might take? Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you all uh, for being here and tuning in. And thank you, uh, Brian, for the question. 
Um, I, I think this question is on everyone's mind, and I did hear that the governor addressed the ability for counties and municipalities uh, to issue uh, shelter in place or stay at home orders. Uh, if you look at some of the data sets and some of the modeling, um, I've been looking at what uh, was prepared by a resource called COVID Act Now. And this was contributed to by data scientists and modeling experts from Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and Brown. So as our physicians indicated, we are at a critical point here. Um, with no action, this model at least, uh, is projecting nearly 69,000 hospitalizations on April 24th with only about 6,000 beds available in the state, which is 10% of what would be required. But as you heard, with proper social distancing, the crest of the transmission curve would occur in the middle of May with uh, fewer hospitalizations. But with an extended shelter in place order, uh, the peak occurs then in June, um, and the number of hospitalizations would fall to under 1,000. Um, which is a really good place uh, we would want to be. Now again, these are projections uh, that were put together by scientists at Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and Brown, and they're using uh, the best information they have uh, that's available. Um, and again, as the physicians uh, um, uh, let us know that growth and infection rates are exponential once we get to a tipping point which we are all actively uh, trying to avoid. So I guess in that context, you know, I um, am personally in favor of pursuing um, shelter-in-place orders, but uh, really, uh, from a county perspective, um, we know that our order will only be effective if uh, different municipalities participate, as Cedar Rapids and the City of Marion are where the population centers are in Lynn County. But you know, here's a thing I think other policymakers need to uh, consider as they weigh um, the economic impact, which I know there are a lot of concerns about that with a shelter in place order, is if you, uh, you know, look at Lynn County as the second largest county in the state, we know that transmission rates tend to be higher where there are uh, large concentrations of people. And we are uh, an urban center in Iowa. So, Again, I am in favor of this, um, and I would encourage um, my peers in local government uh, to consider it, but I know that there are lots of things they need to balance. This is Jeff Pomerantz from the city. There's just a lot of study that still has to be done on this. I know we don't have a lot of time, so we need to move quickly. Uh, personally, I think it makes a lot of sense for our area based on what I'm hearing uh, from, uh, from our physicians and from other experts. But before we make that decision, again, uh, we, we would need, I believe, to have serious discussions, which I think need to be public, certainly with the county, with our elected officials in Cedar Rapids, our mayor, and city council, and as Supervisor Walker said, uh, other entities in the county so that uh, we can have a full and open discussion as to the merits as well as a potential uh, downside. And I would expect uh, that we would have those kinds of discussions uh, soon. Thank you. This is our final question, awesome, also from uh, Brian Morelli. Said, could the transit representatives comment on how many people in the community are dependent on public transit as their sole means of transportation and what level of need they expect? How many, do, how many buses do they have and how many people per bus? Again, Brad DeBrower, I'm transit manager with Cedar Rapids Transit. Um, don't have the specific numbers to Brian's uh, question, but I can say that ridership is currently down 70% from what we typically see on a, a, a typical day for our fixed route bus system. 
And uh, what we're seeing, unfortunately, has been a lot of passengers that not are just trying to get to a critical uh, job or, or destination, but uh, we have been seeing a fair number of social use of the bus. And again, that was critical to part of our, our to our decision as to um, why we were, were, were we shut down or temporarily suspending our service. Um, so I'll turn it over to Tom or Mike as far as answering it from the NTS and Lyft side of things. But uh, again, we are we are seeing a lot of ridership uh, and we have a large decrease in ridership voluntarily, which is what we were hoping to see. Uh, but unfortunately, it's still a lot of social use. Thank you, Brad, and thank you for the question. Uh, Lynn County lifts typically would serve over 300 individual rides per day. That also is down by the, about the same percentages as Brad is. Uh, a lot of that is probably due to the directive from the state to close down the adult day habs, the uh, options of Lynn County, the, the milestones. It's, it's a lot of our people. Uh, the rest of our rides are essential because our very constituency of riders have uh, individual needs and they're the most vulnerable of the populations. They have disabilities, they have a lot of medical conditions. Uh, so it's necessary to continue those rides. Uh, we have, right now we are condensed our service down to six to seven buses per day um, with a, a little bit, bit of a lighter load per bus, again, to get the social distancing correct. Uh, one or two people per bus if we can do it instead of a whole bus full of people. So we're doing everything we can. Uh, our people will remain in need. Our dialysis clients have to go to dialysis on a regular basis. They do not have a choice and we're here to assist our people as best we can. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Mike Barnhart with the uh, Neighborhood Transportation Service with Horizons Inn. Uh, there was a question about capacity, and as uh, Jeff Pomerantz alluded to, we're, we're not the city transit system, and our capacity will be much less. We will have uh, two vehicles out during the day with a capacity of four people to maintain social distancing. And as I left today, uh, folks who work for me were putting uh, plastic up to divide the aisles and plastic up behind the drivers to try to keep people safe and uh, our nighttime service will remain the same. And the other thing that will happen is we will be, there will be no fares collected during this time too to reduce the interaction between uh, drivers and passengers. Thank you. I'd like to invite Heather Metter from uh, Lynn County Health to uh, come and address a clarification item. Heather. Just one clarification, restaurants are closed. However, pickup service and drive-through service is still open, but the sit-down service is closed, but you can still go through uh, the drive-throughs at restaurants. You can still pick up food at restaurants. So thank you. Thank you, the power of text messaging. Um, that concludes today's press conference. I wanna just uh, take a moment if I can to thank the first responders who are out there day in and day out, the people that are continue to go to work every day and respond to protect our community, our police officers, our firefighters, our paramedics, all of our, uh, my specifically my emergency management agency staff that have been working long hours and long weekend days. I, I'm very grateful for the work that they've done and really all of the partners that we've had the pleasure to work with. So thanks to all of those people. We know we have a lot more work to do, um, but we're ready to take that on. Uh, just an administrative note, the next scheduled press conference will be Thursday at 3.30, uh, March 26th, uh, same location. Thursday, March 26th, 3.30, unless we have further breaking information. Thank you.